Chair would ask members to clear the aisle. We're going to do a moment of silence here. Members, the House will come to order. The Chair would ask all present to rise for the purpose of a moment of silence. The Chair asks that the House now observe a moment of silence in remembrance of our brave men and women in uniform who have given their lives in the service of our nation in Iraq and Afghanistan and their families and of all who serve in our armed forces and their families. Thank you. Without objection, five-minute voting will continue. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, the unfinished business of the question on agreeing to the Speaker's approval of the journal, which the Chair will put de novo. The question is on agreeing to the Speaker's approval of the journal. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. It is the opinion of the Chair. The ayes have it. The journal stands approved. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, request a recorded vote. For what purpose does the gentleman from Illinois to request a recorded vote? A recorded vote is requested. Those favoring a recorded vote will rise. A sufficient number having risen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. It's a five minute vote. This will be the last recorded vote of the day. The journal is the official written record of the previous day's activities. They just voted approval of the rule on a bill that would end the Federal Housing Administration refinance program for homes valued at less than the mortgage debate on that tomorrow. Earlier, they voice voted the rule for another bill, which will be debated on Friday, a bill that would eliminate a program providing mortgage assistance to jobless homeowners. But that will pretty much do it for legislative work on the uh, on the House floor this afternoon. They started their day hearing in a joint meeting with the Senate from Australian Prime Minister Julia Gillard. She said that she endorses the U.S. strategy. Australia endorses the U.S. strategy in the war in Afghanistan and promised that uh, her country's cooperation on the increasingly critical Asia Pacific region. And by the way, if you'd like to see that speech, you can find that in our video library at cspan.org. You'll also find there the uh, speech from Monday from Vivian Schiller, the former head of National Public Radio. She spoke at the National Press Club on Monday on the future of public radio, and that is available on our website in the video library at cspan.org. Today she has resigned under pressure from the uh, news organization's board. This comes a day after an undercover video showed one of her executives on a hidden camera calling the Tea Party racist and saying NPR would be better off without federal funding. Vivian Schiller told the Associated Press that the comments were outrageous and unfortunate. Quote, I did not want to leave NPR. There's a lot of pressure on NPR right now, uh, Ms. Schiller told the AP. Quote, it would have to be, it would be, have made things too difficult for stations that face funding threats in Congress without this change. Vivian Schiller stepping down or resigning as the, uh, as the head of National Public Radio. So the last recorded votes on the House floor today, coming up in about a half an hour, a pair of votes in the U.S. Senate on spending for fiscal year 2011. First, the, the bill H.R. 1, the Republican passed bill in the U.S. House from a couple of weeks ago, and then the Democratic alternative. They'll be voted on back to back, a 60 vote threshold for each of those, and you can follow the debate leading up to those votes on C SPAN 2.
On this question, the A's are 326, the nays are 91, one member voting present. The uh, journal stands approved. Purpose does a gentleman from Pennsylvania rise? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that the proceedings had during the recess be printed in the record. That objection. Pursuant to 15 U.S.C. 1024A in the order of the House of January 5, 2011, the chair announces the speaker's appointment of the following members of the House to the Joint Economic Committee. Mr. Hinchy of New York, Mrs. Maloney of New York, Ms. Loretta Sanchez of California, Mr. Cummings of Maryland. Chair lays before the House the following communication. The Speaker's Rooms, Washington, D.C., March 9, 2011. I hereby appoint the Honorable Jerry Lewis, the Honorable Mac Thornberry, the Honorable Fred Upton, the Honorable Andy Harris, and the Honorable Frank R. Wolf to act as Speaker Pro Tempore to sign enrolled bills and joint resolutions through the remainder of the 112th Congress. Signed, John A. Boehner, Speaker of the House of Representatives. Without objection, the appointments are approved. The chair will entertain a request for one-minute speeches. For what purposes does the gentleman for Louisiana seek recognition? I ask unanimous consent to speak to the House for one minute. Without objections, you may proceed. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, what happened to the rule of law? Last week, the U.S. Justice Department announced that President Obama would stop defending the Defense of Marriage Act. I remind you that the President took an oath Should I start over? You may proceed again. Should I start over? Start the one minute over? Okay. Mr. Speaker, what happened to the rule of law? Last week, the U.S. Justice Department announced that President Obama would stop defending the defense of Mary Jack. I remind you that the President took an oath to protect and defend the Constitution. The defense of Mary Jack became law in September 1996 to solidify the traditional marriage within federal law. The President now abandoned the defense of this law, claiming that no reasonable argument can be made to demonstrate that the law is constitutional a position many legal scholars have ridiculed while pointing to a wealth of legal authority, including relevant federal case law. So it appears that not only is the President substituting his power and judgment for that of the Congress when it comes to a number of bold administrative measures to write law from the Oval Office, but he is now substituting his power and judgment for the Supreme Court. It appears to me that President Obama sees no need for the other two branches of the federal government. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. For what purposes? Ask, I ask a unanimous consent to address that for one minute, if I can extend my remarks. So ordered. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I hadn't planned to speak, except I must uh, rebut the nonsense we just heard from the previous speaker. The President of the United States has a duty to faithfully execute the laws. He is doing so. He has said that though he doesn't agree with the Defense of Marriage Act, and he doesn't think it's constitutional, Unlike President Bush, who refused to, act, to implement and to enforce laws he thought were unconstitutional, President uh, Obama is enforcing the law. He is simply not urging it in court. And that's his prerogative, and that's his duty if he doesn't think it's constitutional. Now, the fact of the matter is that given the Supreme Court precedents on, uh, on, the, pr on the standards to use in defending a law that discriminates against people, he had no, he had no choice because when you have a group that's discriminated against, that is not politically powerful to, enough to protect itself, and that, that is inherent in its, in its characteristics, the precedents all say you must have sc heightened scrutiny, and that's what the president is urging in court. But he is enforcing the law, <coughs> and he's doing exactly what he ought to do. I, thank you, and I yield back. For what purposes does the gentleman from Virginia seek recognition?
Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to commemorate the anniversary of the single largest loss of members of the National Guard since World War II. Ten years ago, last week, the Virginia Beach community and really the entire country suffered a tremendous loss when 21 National Guard members perished when their helicopter crashed in southern Georgia during a rainstorm. Eighteen of those members were from Camp Pendleton's Red Horse Guard unit in Virginia Beach, and it included my good friend Paul Kramer. My constituent, Elaine Schmuckler, reached out to our office to share her brother's story. And Richard's honorable legacy lives on today, as does every guardsman who perished on that flight. My thoughts and prayers are with the families today on this uh, somber anniversary. The selfless service of their loved ones and their service to our country will not be forgotten. May God bless them and comfort them. I yield back. Gentlemen, you yield back this time. And for what purposes does the gentleman from uh, Ohio rise? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I request permission to address the House in one minute. Without objection. Today, a bipartisan coalition of members of Congress have introduced. Mr. Speaker, the House is not in order. Will the House be in order, please. Today, a bipartisan coalition of members of Congress have introduced a privileged resolution calling for a vote in this Congress to end the war in Afghanistan. More than 60 percent of the American people want us out of there. This war is already approaching a cost of a half a trillion dollars. We have Americans who are losing their jobs, their wages are being knocked down. We have Americans losing their homes, losing their retirement security. They can't send their schools, their kids to colleges they want. And we're spending all this money on a war that is a waste of time, money, blood, and treasure to try to prop up a corrupt regime in Afghanistan. Now, our occupation over there is fueled in insurgency. It's time for Congress to take its constitutional responsibilities under Article 1, Section 8. We haven't really done that with respect to Afghanistan. It's time for us to do that. Let's have an up or down vote. That's what this resolution is about. And I urge all members of Congress to consider supporting the privileged resolution that ends the war in Afghanistan. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. For what purposes does the gentleman from Georgia rise? Without, without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What is the budget battle about? It is about our country, it is about our kids, and it is about our freedom. Imagine if you were borrowing 40 cents for every one dollar that you spent in your household you would change your purchasing habits. That's what this battle is about. Do we want to leave to our children a legacy of billions and billions of dollars in debt, which they owe to China? That's what this budget battle is about. This is very important stuff. We have to put the politics of spin and positioning and about being Democrats and Republicans, we have to put that aside. We've got to do what's best for the next generation not the best election. We need to come together and come up with common sense solutions because you and I, as Americans, we can do better and we deserve to give our children better than what we're doing right now. Thank you and I yield back. Are there further one minute requests? The chair and ladies before the house, uh, the following personal request. Leaves of absence requested for Mr. Hurd of Virginia for today and Mr. Reichert of Washington for today. Without objection, the requests are granted. One of the speakers announced policy of January 5th, 2011. The gentleman from California, Mr. Garamendi, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the minority leader. Uh, Mr. Speaker, today we want to talk about jobs. The people in my district, the 10th Congressional District of California and Concord, 
Antioch, Pittsburgh, Fairfield, Livermore. They want jobs. They want to go to work. They want this government to create jobs. We're now in the 10th week of the new majority, the Republican majority, and thus far there has not been one significant useful job bill brought to the floor. Instead, we had a CR brought to the floor that in all probability will lose and cost America upside down. 700 Oh, thank you, Betty. 700,000 jobs. That's what the CR, the first piece of legislation introduced by the Republicans, would do. 700,000 jobs. And it's all across the board. Construction jobs, research, manufacturing jobs, education. We just heard one fellow stand up here on the floor and said he was worried about his children. He should be because the bill that he voted for less than 10 days ago would destroy thousands and thousands of teaching jobs across this nation, including 218,000 young children that will not be in the Head Start program. We can't afford that kind of a jobs program. Joining me today is Betty Sutton from the great state of Ohio in the heart of the once very strong manufacturing base of this nation. Ms. Sutton, if you would uh, tell us what's going on in Ohio and how you see these issues. Well, I thank the gentleman and I thank you for your leadership and boy, that, uh, that poster says a lot. Uh, GOP continuing resolution destroys 700,000 plus jobs, possibly yours. And where did we get that number? Let's, before we get to Ohio, where did we get that number? We got that number from a, a number of places. Ben Bernanke said that uh, the, the plan would cut, uh, cost uh, hundreds of thousands of jobs. Um, the GOP's CR, according to Goldman Sachs, would reduce economic growth by 2% and cause the unemployment rate to increase. And a study by the International Monetary Fund concluded that the idea that fiscal austerity stimulates economic activity in the short term finds little support in the data. So, you know, we have a group of 300 economists, including two Nobel laureates, who wrote a letter warning that the short-sighted budget cuts to, quote, human capital, our infrastructure, and the next generation of scientific and technological advances, end quote, would threaten future economic competitiveness as well as our current recovery. So that's where we begin, despite all of this forewarning about what this path will lead us to, we still see a continuing resolution that uh, uh, indicates we're going to lose 700,000 plus jobs. In the state of Ohio, I'm sure that a number of people, uh, most of the people out there have seen at the state house, we're, we're witnessing uh, democracy in action, at least from the outside, because for a while there, the state house doors were closed when all of the workers and fair minded Ohioans descended upon our state's capital to protest against what the governor, uh, the Republican governor there, is trying to do to public sector workers. Under the guise of, of uh, taking care of our deficit, an attack on workers' rights is, is, is being waged not only in Ohio, but across this country from Wisconsin to Ohio to the floor of Congress, where we've seen attack after attack. And, and really, the, it's really a sad thing because we all know we should be focused and the other side should join us in focusing on priority one, which is putting people back to work. In Ohio, the key to our budget problems is more people working than you have revenue to pay for the public services and the public sector employees who help to make our world turn. Can you imagine the idea? It was not the workers in Wisconsin or Ohio or across this country that drove our economy off the cliff. It was not those teachers or those firefighters who rush into those burning buildings when we run out of them. It was not the police officers who are out there on our streets protecting us and keeping our community safe. It was not the workers. The workers are not the problem. They are part of the solution of where we need to go. But the bottom line is we need to be focused on creating jobs, and it's just amazing that not only are 
Our friends across the aisle, the Republicans, not interested in focusing on that. Ten weeks on the job, zero jobs. Uh, they're actually looking at cutting those people who do have jobs, their rights. And it's just fundamentally unfair and it's counterproductive. We all know that we need to trim back our budget, but we should always be willing to trim back the budget, but only by engaging in smart cuts, not just indiscriminate cuts that don't. What, what happens when a person doesn't have a job? What happens when 700,000 people don't have a job? Do we think they just disappear? That they are no cost to our government, to our country? Not to mention the loss of, of, of dignity and, and the loss of opportunity. Everything that our country stands for. Having a chance to make a way for your family, to feed your family and take care of your family. It's, it's a crazy idea to say that we can make cuts that cut hundreds of thousands of jobs and somehow that will lead us to prosperity. And reduce the budget uh, deficit. I'm wondering uh, about our president in his State of the Union said that we have to out-educate, out-research, out-manufacture and out-build the rest of the world. But yet the first piece of legislation, significant piece of legislation that the Republicans moved to this House goes exactly the opposite direction. It does in fact reduce the education. Uh, thousands of, I guess maybe uh, 20 or 30,000 teachers are going to lose their jobs. Kids will not be there. But the thing that really struck me, we were talking earlier with my colleague from Maryland about this, uh, the research. In the area of research, which are tomorrow's jobs, what does this CR do? What does the Republican caucus want to do? They want to cut back on the research. And so we're looking at a significant number. I think it's over 5,000 key researchers. Could you share with us your experience and your knowledge? Because you are in one of the research centers, our colleague from Maryland. Well, I want to thank you, Mr. Garamendi, for bringing this to our attention. Um, I've been thinking a lot about the role of research and development to the 21st century and to 21st century job creation. In fact, I've introduced along with you and a number of our, our colleagues, uh, my colleague from Maryland, Republican Roscoe Bartlett, um, H.R. 689, which is the 21st Century Reinvestment Act. And the goal is to create, to um, invest in research and development, expand our tax credit for research and development, make it permanent, and then link it to manufacturing. And here's been my experience. In the 4th Congressional District, we are home uh, to some of the most fantastic research innovation that's happening anywhere in the country. That's true all across the country. But these sort of robust and innovative uh, firms, some of, many of them are small firms, and they can't afford to just front load R&D to create manufacturing jobs. But they need the government to have a tax policy that actually encourages that. And so I'm all in favor, actually, of a tax policy that encourages the positive things that we want, research and development, job creation, manufacturing. And instead, what did we get out of, uh, out, out of Congress? We got a tax bill that rewards the top 2% with tax breaks that they're never going to put back into the economy. We've had 10 weeks of a Republican revolution here in the House of Representatives that has created zero jobs. And in fact, a uh, continuing resolution uh, out of this House of Representatives, this Republican-led House of Representatives, that would destroy 700,000 jobs. It's as if we're saying, no, we don't really like the 21st century. We want to go back to the 19th and the 20th century. And that is not how you rebuild a manufacturing base in this country. And so I've actually been struck traveling throughout my congressional district at small firms like Wabtec up in uh, Gaithersburg, Maryland, which is doing some really innovative R&D, research and development, to develop signaling systems um, that will help us with high-speed rail. Guess what? They've just had to lay off workers because we are not making the right kinds of investments into research and development and technology that's about jobs for the 21st century. And the president got it right. He said, you know what? We have to out-innovate, out-educate, and out-build. And the way that we do that, of course, is to invest in our educators, invest in our young people, and we're doing exactly the opposite. The Republican majority is doing the exact opposite here in this Congress. Again, 10 weeks 
of work and not a single job. In fact, Congressman Pete Sessions from Texas has just said, you know what, we're not going to create a jobs bill at all. Uh, we're not interested in jobs. All we're interested in is cutting government spending. Well, let's look at what they're cutting. Some of the most innovative research that's going on in this country. Out of our, our, um, our, our NOAA that looks at our weather service, that makes sure that our farmers understand what's happening with our climate and our weather so that they can engage in, in production of, of uh, products throughout this country. What, are, what else are we doing? Well, we say we, the National Institutes of Health doesn't need $2.5 billion to continue innovative research in cancer and other things, things that actually play out in terms of the marketplace, creating private sector jobs in a new economy. And so I am really struck by the language of small business, the language of innovation, the language of job creation, but not a single job. Zero jobs, 10 weeks of a Republican revolution, zero jobs, 700,000 jobs lost. And so I would urge my colleagues that if they really want to be about the 21st century, then they should join us in expanding the research and development tax credit so those innovative firms can uh, invest in all the technologies of the future so that we can produce the PhDs who are needed to conquer the 21st century and then link that to manufacturing so that the small firms in my district and all across the country can take advantage of a research and development tax credit because they are making things where making it in America well if America is going to make it we must once again make it in America manufacturing matters and the first step in the manufacturing of this century is the research it's the well-educated workforce that's capable of doing the new things and the research that goes with it and you're very fortunate in your district to have some major research facilities uh, NOAA, NASA are in this area. In my own district, I have the Lawrence Livermore Labs and adjacent to it, the Lawrence Berkeley Labs and the Berkeley campus as well as the University of California Davis campus where research is what it's all about. In the continuing resolution, 700,000 jobs. That's a big number and we just don't focus on that. But we're talking about real people. This is the job next to you that's going to be lost. Uh, Sandia Laboratories were in, was in my office no more than an hour ago, talking about research for nuclear power and how we're going to deal with that. And I told him, if the Republicans get their way, 5,500 researchers at the national labs are going to lose their jobs. So what of tomorrow's energy systems? $1.7 billion would be, re would be taken out of the Department of Energy's future energy research. So solar, photovoltaic, biofuels, advanced biofuels, the research for tomorrow so that we can actually wean ourselves from foreign oil. Gone. Gone. You go, what is this, just a feeding frenzy? Is it wise? Is there any real thought put on this? I think the answer for me is no. I think you saw that in your... And I noticed that our colleague new to the House, but not new to the issues from Rhode Island has joined us, um, so how does this affect Rhode Island? What's this mean to your state? Uh, thank you for, uh, for organizing this special order. This is, uh, I'm new to this chamber. I've been here two months, uh, but I think the poll that was released today, uh, the Bloomberg poll uh, released this morning, again found that America's top priority is jobs and getting people back to work. We've been here 10 weeks, and the Republican-controlled co Congress has presented zero jobs, hasn't presented a jobs bill, and has presented a spending plan that will cause, cost 700,000 jobs. That's a, a, an analysis done by respected economists across the country. Uh, Rhode Island is a state that has a very rich manufacturing history. Uh, we are the place where the Industrial Revolution began, home to some of the greatest manufacturing. And I think like many states, we have suffered in this recent economy. Uh, Rhode Island has been particularly hard hit. But I think if we are going to remain a world economic power, we absolutely have to make things again in America. And, you know, if you ask people who believe that we're losing that position as a world economic power, and that you ask them, who do they think is the world economic power, they say China. And if you say, why China? They say, because China makes everything. I asked my constituents during my campaign, go into a store in Rhode Island. Try to find something made in America. 
It's almost impossible. And I really hope that the 112th Congress will be the Congress that revitalizes manufacturing in America. And that means working hard to be sure we have a national manufacturing policy, be sure that we provide manufacturers with the tools that they need to compete in the 21st century, to be sure we have trade policies and workforce investments that allow them to compete uh, globally, and to be really making the kinds of investments in manufacturing that are necessary not only to create jobs in the short term, but to assure the long-term economic health and prosperity of our country. And what I'm afraid the Republicans have proposed in their budget uh, uh, proposal, in an effort to make cuts now, our look, we have to cut spending. We have to be responsible about managing this deficit. But we have to do it in a smart and strategic way that protects our investments in education, in innovation, in science and research, so that we can make the new discoveries, develop the new products, and then manufacture them and lead the world as an economic power. Um, this is an opportunity uh, to, to really understand the urgency of supporting manufacturing so that we can start making things again in this country, start selling goods. That's how the middle class was built in America, was through manufacturing. That's the, what built this country, a strong middle class. And the ongoing uh, uh, decisions that have been made by my friends on the other side of the aisle are undermining the middle class are weakening the ability for manufacturing to grow, and I think that they're, they're the wrong decisions for our country. Uh, thank you very much for the perspective from Rhode Island. I was uh, years ago on the Black River, which I think was the Black heart yes. of the industrial of the industrial revolution here in the United States, and they were using water power for the mills at that time. Uh, fascinating, great history, and now the most advanced technology is also done in Rhode Island, a lot of it having to do with the, uh, uh, the construction of uh, submarines and the like. Uh, very, very advanced. But all of that comes from the research, the engineering, the STEM education, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. I'd like to turn back to our colleague from uh, Maryland, and uh, I see that she has a few more thoughts. She was kind of anxious to get back into this discussion. I, I want to thank you, Mr. Garamendi, because I'm excited about the prospect of manufacturing again in America. Uh, in my home state of Maryland, about 40% of our economic base was manufacturing. Today, that's under 10%. And I think that that's a sign of what's happened all across this country, but it doesn't have to remain that way. Today, we heard the Prime Minister of Australia express a belief in America that I want America to express in herself in terms of us leading the world in technology development and manufacturing for the 21st century. Um, we need to return to that. There's still a lot of innovation that's going on, but let me tell you what's happened over the last couple of decades. The United States used to have the number one research and development tax credit in the world. Today, we're number 17, from number one to number 17. And what that means when you begin to lose a hold of your innovation and other people are doing that innovation, pretty soon the production lines move to where the innovation is taking place. And so it's no accident that manufacturing is leaving to where some of that innovation is taking place in other countries. I want to make sure that we're doing it, that we are making it, that we are manufacturing it right here in the United States. Let's take solar panels as an example. All of the great solar technology that we have developed right here in the United States. Where do we make solar panels? Every place else, particularly in, in China. Well, we should be making those in the United States. Production lines and manufacturing lines that are actually close to where the research and development is taking place. And we can go industry by industry, sector by sector, and make the argument for making it in America. We are great innovators, but we don't want to be at number 17 when it comes to incentivizing through our tax policy good things, incentivizing innovation and, uh, and manufacturing here in the United States, creating local jobs. I mean, the couple of firms that I talked about, they have 200 employees, and you know, some of those employees graduated high school and they're working on that production line. High paid jobs working on that production line, and they're working alongside engineers who have PhDs and they're researchers with PhDs all along that production line, a couple of hundred employees. Well, we should be doubling and tripling that all across communities across this country so that uh, we're not at 10% of manufacturing capacity in my state, 
but we're at 40 and 50 percent because then people are working, they've got good jobs, they've got great education, and we are making it in America. Uh, let me pick up a couple of the themes that you hit upon. Uh, one of them, uh, the continuing on with research in this area of this part of the country, and certainly in the San Francisco Bay Area where I represent, uh, health care research is huge. It is an extraordinarily big part of the economy, both the research and then the spin-offs from it. We call this the biotech, and this is almost entirely health care related biotech. We also have the biofuels, again, coming out of research. The Republican continuing resolution reduces funding for the National Institute of Health by $1.6 billion. We're talking about 25,000 health-related research projects that will either stop, be delayed, or pushed off the track. 25,000, we're talking about things that are really serious to us. Heart disease, diabetes, cancer, all of the things that affect every American and literally everybody in this world, the research would be slowed down, stopped, and in some cases terminated as a result of the feeding frenzy that went on here on this floor where more than 400 amendments were considered with very, very little thought. Our colleague Betty Sutton talked about, yes, cuts, but be smart with your cuts. Don't just take whatever is on your mind whatever the latest soundbite is, because it may have a very detrimental effect. You're looking at, in this case, the National Institute of Health. Human health, our well being as Americans, 25,000 research jobs would be terminated. Now, the, the press doesn't follow the details. The press follows the game. Is the Senate going to act, or will we have a, will we have a government shutdown? That's an interesting game. But underlying those will they, won't they issues are the issues of what actually is in the legislation. And this particular piece of legislation, 700,000 jobs, critical needs that we have as human beings for health, jobs that we need in the future, whether they are in the science field, in the manufacturing field, and jobs for today in the construction industry pulling money out of construction for infrastructure, programs to provide clean water for our communities. Thousands of those programs will die as a result of the Republican continuing resolution which is now before the Senate. Hopefully the Senate will be wiser than what happened here on the floor. Uh, we can go on and on. I developed a list, I call it the Dirty Dozen, and these are specific things. Education, I know that's a big thing in your district, the University of Maryland. I think it's adjacent to your district. But you claim it, don't you? Well, let me just uh, go because I actually, I'm having a conversation this afternoon with the president of the University of Maryland. I was out at the University of Maryland campus over the past weekend. And like campuses all across this country that are engaged in, you know, some of the top-notch research that's going on in the country, I was with 300 young people from kindergarten to 12th grade over at the University of Maryland, all interested in the STEM fields, interested in science, technology, engineering, and math, interested in making a career in those fields that are about the 21st century. And sadly, here we are in the United States Congress, completely disconnected to communities, completely disconnected to young people and their aspirations for the future, cutting, slashing, burning, cutting programs that are about educating our young people to take advantage of the 21st century. And so it just seems that there's a complete disconnect between what the majority is doing and how that will play out for our future. And so I had to say to these young people, you know, stay with it. Stick with those STEM fields, with the science and the technology and the engineering and math. Go on to that engineering uh, school. Go on into the bio, uh, biosciences um, that we see coming out of the University of Maryland. Go on into the space program because we're investing in technologies, not that just are going to open up our universe, but that actually have real application here on Earth. And we have to continue our young people to do that. 
but it really does fly in the face of what's actually being done by this Republican majority to cut away at education for the future, to say we don't really want to manufacture things here in the United States, to say that we don't really care whether we make that research and development tax credit uh, permanent so that small firms can, uh, can innovate and create and hire. Um, but we know that America cares about those things, and that's why it's important for us to have this conversation with the American people about what it's going to take really to jumpstart the economy and the things that are happening in this Congress that are going to put you know, a kibosh on that. Uh, cutting 700,000 jobs, zero jobs created in 10 weeks of this Congress and not investing in our future, not investing in our manufacturing. Precisely so. At the uh, University of Maryland, I suspect it's similar to what I found in the California State University system, which is the largest university system, they would argue, in the world. We may want to find out what China's actually up to, but it's a huge system. Uh, the Pell Grants is a critical element in providing the opportunity for students to stay in school. Yet the continuing resolution supported by the Republicans here on this floor and now over in the Senate for consideration would drastically reduce the Pell Grant by some $870 per person at the same time that the tuition at all of the universities is going up, literally making it very difficult for tens or hundreds of thousands of uh, students to stay in school. And these are the future workers in the high-value jobs that we need here in America. So it's not just the higher education and the Pell Grants that are being cut, but at the beginning, the Head Start program. We're talking about young children who do not have an opportunity because of their family's poverty to get started in education, a proven program that actually works. Now, not every Head Start program, and last year we put together a program to weed out those that are not successful, and bring in new ones that would be, would be able to replace them. But 218,000 young children from impoverished families are going to be thrown off of the Head Start program, not next year, but as soon as this continuing resolution becomes law. And we can't let that happen. So we'll fight fiercely, and hopefully the President, should this somehow pass the Senate and come back to this House and be passed, the president should veto it because I know that he wants to out-educate, out-build, and out-innovate every other country in the world. And you cannot do that with a, unless you have a highly educated workforce soon and later, beginning with those children in the Head Start program. Now, this is a program in your area, as I understand, that uh, is important to you. Well, you just yesterday, Educators from my congressional district were here on Capitol Hill. They were educators at, from Bowie State University, a historically black uh, college um, that, is in, that is now poised to get research grants going into historically black colleges and universities cut by the Republican majority in the continuing resolution. There were representatives here from the University of Maryland. I've spoken again about the wonderful work that they are doing in cybersecurity, in, um, in aerospace uh, research over at that university campus cut in this continuing resolution. There were educators from our community college colleges that are training both young people and people who want new and, um, and real skills for this new economy cut in this continuing resolution. And you spoke about the Pell Grants, what these universities and community colleges share in common in higher education is that they know that in order to bring up the most diverse work workforce, a trained and skilled workforce, we also need students who come from vulnerable families, whose families can't afford to send them to school. And what have we done? We've cut out of that continuing resolution, the Republican majority has cut, what, $845, $870 from Pell Grants. And you know what that means? That's books for a semester 
not even two semesters, but you know, probably a semester. And so I, I have to wonder what the majority is thinking about the future. They may be thinking about today, maybe, and we can argue about that, but they surely are not thinking about the future by cutting education, by not investing in manufacturing, by not in investing in research, by not investing in all of the things that will make us competitive for the 21st century. I noticed that our colleague, you bracket, we kind of bracket the United States here. We got the East Coast with Maryland and I'm out on the Pacific Coast, but somewhere in between, I believe, is the state of Colorado. And I noticed our colleague from the state of Colorado uh, was standing over there and he had that, I got to get involved in this look. Please join us and share with us uh, Colorado, which has some of these programs and very, very important to all of it. Well. Your point uh, to my friend from uh, California is that uh, manufacturing matters and having jobs in America matters. That, uh, you know, if we make it in America, we will make it in America. Our focus should be on providing good jobs here with good infrastructure, whether that's education, highways, transit, energy in this country, so that for ourselves, our kids, our grandkids, there's a prosperous future. But the Republicans completely missed that entire approach. And, and I liken it to this. Everybody says, let's look at the, this as if it's a family, and a family has to tighten its belt sometime. No question about it, but let's really look at what's occurred here and talk about the country as a family because we are all in this together. You know, sometimes we can do something by ourselves, but most of the time we're in this together. And so what's happened here, let's look at it, is at the beginning of uh, this century, back in 2001, 2002, the country took a voluntary pay cut. When the tax cuts under Bush came down, the country took a voluntary pay cut. So then the next thing that happens is besides taking a voluntary pay cut, that family or that person goes out and he builds two houses. We went to war twice in the Middle East to the tune of who knows how much money, but at least a trillion dollars. So now we've taken a pay cut. We are building two houses. Two and, wars. Which are two wars. And all of a sudden, the breadwinner has a heart attack. And, isn't, and that's what happened in the fall of 2008 when we had the financial crash. So no income or lower income and lots of hospital bills. And those hospital bills came in the form of unemployment insurance, COBRA for health insurance, and all sorts of things designed to keep the country moving forward despite the financial crash. So now, just as the person begins to recover, the breadwinner recovers from the heart attack and is starting to earn a salary again, hospital bills start dropping, but you still have hospital bills to pay. My friends on the Republican side of the aisle said, wait a second, we should pay them all right now. No question that they have to be paid, but you also got to get healthy. And just as we're starting to add jobs in this country, just as people are starting to get back to work, my friends on the Republican side of the aisle want to blame the debt of this country, not on the voluntary pay cut, the tax cuts, not on the two wars, not on the financial crash. They want to blame it on Head Start. They want to blame it on energy efficiency. They want to blame it on education. Those are the kinds of things that make the patient stronger and healthier and this nation stronger and healthier so that we can have jobs here, so that we can build things here, so that we can have a prosperous future for ourselves and our kids. And my friends on the Republican side of the aisle are so misdirected on this that it's scary. And Americans should really sit up and take notice that their future is really being put to the test by the approach that the Republicans want to take to balancing our budget and to building our future. And with that, I'd return the, the conversation to my friend from California. Well, let's, let's continue the conversation for a few moments here. Uh, presumably, these cuts were made to deal with the deficit. 
We've got a deficit problem. Thank you so very much for going back to the history of how we wound up with this huge deficit problem. Uh, it did begin in 2000 when the Clinton administration left office. The projection for the decade 2000 to 2010 was there would be a $5 trillion surplus. $5 trillion surplus based upon the policies that were in place when Clinton left office, 2001. $5 trillion surplus. Literally paying off all of America's debt. Gone. History. What happened? How well you said it. Two tax cuts that were not paid for, that cut the revenue of the federal government. Two wars, Afghanistan and Iraq, not paid for. First time in America's history that we went to war without having some way to pay for it. That is, some tax policy to pay for it. And then, on top of that, a Medicaid, a Medicare program, the drug benefit, again, multi hundred billion dollar program not paid for, and then the heart attack. The crash of the world economy caused by excess Wall Street exuberance, in many cases that exuberance was fraud, misdirection, and the collapse of the financial industry, taking down the world economy and our economy. Would the gentleman yield for one I second? I certainly and, will. And to that point, the financial heart attack that, the, uh, that this country suffered and the world suffered, now the country starts to get back on its feet. Under Barack Obama, in March, March 9th of 2009, two years ago, the president had been in office for one month we hit the bottom of the stock market. It had fallen some 6,000 points in the last months of George Bush. Since the President Obama came into office, the stock market has gained 6,000 points. Almost two years ago to the day, the stock market reversed itself under his leadership. Now, part of that is we put some police back on Wall Street not in an excessive way, but in a way to make sure that investors and people dealing with the financial industry were getting a fair shake. And confidence has been restored to some degree in the, in the financial industry. Now, my f Republican friends, that's another place they want to cut. Let's take the cops back off the beat, both on Wall Street as well as all across the country. Again, a very wrong-headed move to build the future of this nation. Now, I'd like to just do one other family analogy, if I could. Uh, so, you know, we've had this tremendous fall. The family has got to, you know, manage its expenses. It needs to get its income up, and it needs to manage the expense side. So what we have is, say, okay, we got Aunt Maud. She's in a nursing home. We got nephew Joey, he's, he's in a preschool, you know, down the street, and we got Uncle Rex, who's an oil company executive. And we've been helping all of them. We've been helping Aunt Maud, we've been helping nephew Joey, we've been helping Uncle Rex. Well, under the Republican approach, they want to kick Aunt Maud out of the nursing home. They want to make sure there's no preschool for nephew Joey, but they want to keep sending the check to Uncle Rex. We're all in this together. If we want to manage this deficit, if we want to pay down the debt, we are all in this together. And the approach that they've taken just doesn't make sense. Uh, if we were to look at the proposal that uh, President Obama put forth in his budget, came out about a month ago, he put forth a program that would hold government expenditures at a five-year freeze. That is no increase, but being able to continue to pay for those necessary programs for Aunt Maud and for Nephew Rick. Was it Nephew Rick? Nephew Joey. Nephew Joey. It was uh, that other uncle that was making off uncle like a Rex. bandit. Um, so that was to freeze the level of expenditure and to put in place tax policies so that uh, your oil company executive would begin paying a fair share rather than getting 
a very significant tax break, beginning to pay their share back into this economy. Over time, and this was about in seven years, the percentage of the uh, GDP, the gross domestic product, that was to debt or to the deficit would fall from around 11 percent down to about 3 percent so that it would be managed over time. Going back to your analogy, you've got that all of those debts built up during the 2000 to 2010 period and or 2008 period and then taking time, six, seven years, to bring it back under control, not with the kind of chaotic cuts that are now being proposed by our Republican friends where we would actually slow down the economy, throw some 700,000 people out of work, reducing tax revenues, increasing unemployment, unemployment expenses go up, uh, hospital emergency room expenses go up because people no longer have health care, and on the other end, people losing their homes. You don't have a job, you can't pay the mortgage, you're going to lose your home. So the housing market would also be hit as a result of the proposal that actually passed this floor with Republican support. There, I think there are only three or four Democrats that voted for it. We need to have a wise policy. We need to make cuts. To be sure, we need to make cuts. And I want to put one example on the table here before we go any further and people think that we're not supporting cuts. We asked last year the uh, Congressional Research Office, nonpartisan group, to take a look at governmental programs and to tell us where the duplication is, where the unnecessary programs are in governmental programs. That report just came out yesterday. And I was thumbing through it quickly. I don't have it in front of me, but I was going through it. And what struck me was that most of the duplication, most of the unnecessary programs and the waste turned out to be in one department of this government. Happens to be the Department of Defense. No surprise. No surprise. Duplication. Unnecessary expenditures. And line after line after line came up that that's where we should be focusing. There are other programs to be sure, but the big bucks, the big dollars were in the Department of Defense. Now, it's pretty well known, certainly in my district, and I'd like anybody else to know, that I think this war in Afghanistan ought to end right away. That's $120 billion. Let's just say we leave behind in Afghanistan for social economic development to deal like a laser on al-Qaeda, the real terrorists that may be there and in Pakistan and other places. Let's just say we can take back $100 billion. That happens to be $40 billion more than the congressional resolution that was, the continuing resolution that was put forth here. Don't want to get too far off track, but that's a lot of money. And ultimately, we're going to leave, and they're going to go about doing what they need to do over there, but we need to focus on the terrorism and focus significantly like a laser on that. Um, maybe I got a little bit off track with it, but if we're, you want to save $100 billion, there's a hundred well, billion. Would the gentleman yield? Please. So I. I